When Hurricane Matthew hit Florida and the East Coast recently, Barbie was worried about her mother, so she called her. Her mother lives in West Palm Beach where they grew up. She lives in a condominium on the 14th floor near the beach. And Barbie told her she wanted her to leave, and her mother said, no, I'm staying right here. And she arranged for family to come pick her mother up. She said, don't send anybody. I'm staying right here. And the night came when the storm was going to hit, and she was so worried about her mother. That night, she said, what are you going to do, Mom? She said, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to bed. And I'll call you in the morning. The next morning, she called, and everything was fine. She lived through those storms before. How many of you know if you live through a storm, it helps you get through the next one? Amen. She slept through Hurricane Matthew. And that's what I want to talk about today, sleeping in a storm. That's what Jesus did when he was in a great storm. According to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, we find the story, verse 35 through 41. When evening came, the Bible says, after he'd been teaching all day, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the great sea of Galilee. That night, they got in the boat and began to set sail. During the night, a great storm came up, a furious squall, so much so that the waves began to break over into the boat. But Jesus was asleep in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Then Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the winds died down and there was a great calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and said, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey his voice. Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be great if you could sleep in a storm? What a picture of peace. Jesus asleep in the middle of a great storm. If we could just have that kind of peace that Isaiah talked about, that God would keep us in perfect peace if our minds were stayed on him. If we could have had the peace Jesus promised us, the night he went to the cross and yet he said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. If we could just have the peace the Apostle Paul experienced in prison, yet he writes in Philippians, don't worry about anything, but with prayer and petition, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If I could just have perfect peace of the peace that Jesus had, if I could just have a peace that transcends all understanding, if I could just sleep in a storm, what if you could sleep? through the storms of your life? What if you had that kind of peace when you're going through financial storms, marriage storms, yes. storms with your family, Amen. personal storms in your life, a storm of a health crisis? What if you could sleep in the storm? What if you had so much peace that you could sleep even in a storm? And how do we have that? How do we live that? You know, those disciples learned three great lessons of faith that night that we need to learn. They discovered three truths that night with Jesus in that storm that began to deliver them from their fear and their worry. And when you learn these things, and I learn them, you and I will be able to sleep in a storm. And the first thing that they learned that night was that they were always in God's care. When the storm raged, they were afraid, and they said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Even though they knew the Lord Jesus, even though they had already seen him work miracles, even though they had heard his teaching of the word of God that day, even though they had already been called and commissioned as apostles, yet they doubted the one thing all of us seem to doubt, and that is that God really cares about us. And I'm amazed at how many of us who know the Lord still struggle with. People talk to me all the time about their life, or they feel like they failed God, and they question, does God really love me? Does God really care about my life? It seems to be the one truth that's the most difficult for us to grasp is that God loves us, and if we belong to him, that God will care for us, and God will take care of us. And yet we find ourselves in a crisis, in a storm, and we too say, Lord, don't you care? And they doubted that God 
cared about them. They struggle as we do with a deep understanding that God loves me with an everlasting love and that God will take care of me and my family. He'll take care of me through the storm. Let me ask you a question. What difference does it make if you go through the storm and you're going to come out okay on the other end? He said, let's go over to the other side. He meant he's going to the other side. And the storm is not going to change what he has decreed. And yet in the middle of the storm, they doubted that he really cared about them. Now, if you go through that and you have a lot of anxiety and worry, and you are doubting that God cares about you, I want to give you an assignment that you can begin to break that spirit of fear off of your life. I want you to get a copy of Psalm 121. Psalm 121. And I want you to either write it down or put it on your phone. And every time you're in a storm and you panic and you start saying to yourself, does God really care about me? Does God love me? Is God going to bless me through this? Then I want you to take this psalm out and I want you to say it out loud. I don't want you to just read it and keep it in your mind. I want you to say it and declare it. Do you know the things that you declare, you'll believe more firmly? You know, when you say something, you hear it and your mind records it again. What does Psalm 121 declare? I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot slip. He who watches you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord will be your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. The Lord will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming, both now and for ever. When that anxiety rises up and that fear and you begin to question, does God really care? You've got to declare, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Not from man, not from human institutions, not from the government, not from physicians, not from psychologists, not from preachers. My help comes from the Lord. He watches over my life. He will watch over my coming and my going, both now and forever. Hallelujah. At least they did the right thing when they were afraid. They at least woke Jesus up. They turned to the Lord, in other words, and that's what you've got to do. That's the first thing you and I have to do in the storm. Turn to the Lord and turn the fear and the worry over to the Lord. They did the right thing. In fact, that's a kind of a picture of prayer. When you feel the panic and anxiety, go to the Lord and turn it over to him. You're not a victim of your circumstances. You're a victim of your own fears. You're not a victim of your situation. You're a victim of your thinking. It's the fearful thinking and the panic attacks that are troubling your life. The storm is going to pass. God is going to take care of you through the storm. Yes. Peter teaches us the same thing, and maybe that's why he would later write this, because he lived through it in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast your anxiety on the Lord, because he cares for you. That's a restatement of an old psalm, Psalm 55, verse 12. Cast your burden on the Lord, the thing that weighs you down. Cast it onto the Lord, and he will sustain you. That's the thing you do with your trouble and your panic and your worry. Cast it on the Lord. I read about a couple who decided that they were going to create a God box. So they got a little box, and they wrote the word God on it in big letters. And they mounted it high above the pantry door in the kitchen. And they agreed that whenever they got worried about family situations and job situations and health issues and the kids, and they started feeling anxious, that they would write down their worry and their anxiety on a piece of paper. And they'd get out a chair, stand in the chair, and put it in the God box and picture themselves giving it to God. And anytime they wanted to worry about it again, they had an agreement that you couldn't worry about it and start talking about it until you got the chair out, climbed up on the chair, you got to fish through all those pieces of paper and get out that one thing you're still worried about, and now you've got it. You've got to decide whether or not God's got it or you got it. If God's got it, you're in good shape. If you've got it, you're in for a rough night. Yes. One of my close friends, Terry Ross, who used to serve as our missions pastor, his grandfather was a Church of God minister during the days of the Depression. 
up in North Carolina. He had a small church in a mill town in a little town of North Carolina. Things were very lean. They were very hard. No one had much money at all. And they were going through a very lean time in their family. They had a small church, barely getting supported. And they'd run out of nearly all of the groceries. They had hardly nothing left. And his wife said, I got next to nothing to fix dinner for the family tonight. She said, I'm so worried about how are we going to make it and how are we going to take care of our kids. So he got his wife and his three kids together. And they, he said, let's sit down at the kitchen table here. He said, now I want us to take out a big piece of paper. Now let's go around the room. Everybody, you say exactly what you want. If we could go shopping tonight at the grocery store and you could buy anything you wanted, they begin to make them a long grocery list of what they really wanted. Just see the pantry full. And after they made it, he joined hands and said, now let's pray and ask God to provide. And they prayed over everything on that list and that God would touch them. And she made a little something for the kids. About two hours later that night, there was a knock at the door. He came to the door and there was one of the members of his church. He said, Pastor, he said, I hope I'm not inconveniencing you and your family, but just a couple of hours ago, the Holy Spirit impressed me so strongly that I needed to go to the grocery store and buy your family groceries. I hope this is not an inconvenience. And he said, not at all. And so everybody in the family helped get all these bags of groceries that filled up the front porch and brought it in and put it all on the kitchen table. And he thanked this man for his kindness and the man left. And then they sat down and began to open all those grocery bags and every item on that list was in those bags and much more. <laughs> Cast your anxiety on the Lord because he cares for you. God will take care of us through the storm. And when you know that, you can sleep in the storm. But the second great lesson they learned that night was that they were also in God's control. Now that storm was out of control. Those waves were out of control. That wind was out of control. The situation was out of control, but they learned that they were still in God's control. And when the storms of life are raging and things feel like they're out of control and your marriage is out of control and your kids are out of control and you look at the world today, you feel like the nation's out of control. You feel like the world is coming apart at the same. Things feel like they're out of control. The only way that you can have peace in your heart is to realize the world may be out of control, but it's in God's control. And this is what the Bible means by the concept of the sovereignty of God. The, the sovereignty of God does not mean that God predestines every detail of a person's life. That's not what the sovereignty of God means. The word sovereignty means rulership or power. It is the word for king. We used to call kings the sovereign. The sovereignty of God reminds us that God is king, that God sets the laws. God makes the rules. God is in charge. God governs even in the affairs of life. And even though your life may be out of control, it's still within the limits of God's control. Now, that doesn't mean that God controls every detail of everything that happens historically, but it means that God sets the limits, and God marks out the boundaries, and God determines the outcome. The sovereignty of God means that God determines the outcome. And when they got in that boat with Jesus, he said, let's go over to the other side. He didn't say, let's drown in the middle of the sea. He set out the limits. Even though the storm came, that storm was not going to change what he had decreed. And when you look at your life, the moment may feel out of control, but you've got to back up from that. If you belong to the Lord, then you are governed by the sovereignty of God, and God is in control of your life. And God's not going to make every little detail happen, but he's going to set the larger limits. He's going to mark out the boundaries. That's why every now and again, you see history kind of bump up against God's boundaries, and God says, you've gone as far as you're going to go, and you've done as much as you're going to do. The freedom of man is governed by the sovereignty of God. When we say that man has freedom of choice, he does. But we do not have unlimited freedom of choice. Our freedom is limited by the sovereignty of God. Power belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong even to the devil. Psalm 62, 11 says, power belongs to God. Everybody say that. 
power belongs to God and nobody else. God governs and God decides everything that happens in this planet, what is permissible and what is not permissible. And when things are out of control in your life, if you look at that, you're going to be full of panic. If you back up from that and say, no, I'm in the hand of God. God is ultimately in control. He marks out the limits. He sets the boundaries and he determines the outcome of this situation. All through the Bible, we are taught that God is king, that God is sovereign, that God rules, that God governs, and that God is in control. When Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the first thing they did was sing in praise. That's the first song recorded in the Bible, Exodus 15. The Lord has triumphed gloriously. He's saying, the horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed in pieces the enemy who is like you, O Lord, glorious in holiness, doing wonders. And he ended that song in Exodus 15, verse 18. And he said, the Lord will reign forever and forever. This is what the Bible means in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 6. O Lord, are you not the God who is in heaven? Power and might are in your hand. You rule over the kingdoms of the nations, and no one can withstand you. This is what the psalmist made in Psalm 103 verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. From Genesis to Revelation, Whenever you read the phrase, the throne of God, it is a symbol of the sovereignty of God, that God governs everything that happens in this universe, and yes, everything that happens on this planet. When I look at politicians today, I'm reminded of Proverbs 21, verse 1, the heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord, and he directs it like a water course wherever he determines. I think of what it says in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34, his dominion is an eternal dominion and his kingdom endures for generation to generation. I think of the words of the prophet as he looked down the card of time and saw the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And here it is, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. We come to the book of Revelation, and the first vision that John sees in heaven after he's met the risen Lord is a throne of God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I was caught up into heaven, and I saw before me a throne and someone sitting on it. Did you know that in the great book of Revelation, a book of symbols, that the most common and most used symbol in the book of Revelation is the throne of God? It's not 666. Who cares what that is? It's not the Antichrist. Who cares who he is? It's not Armageddon. Who cares what that is? The number one symbol is the throne of God. It is mentioned 45 times in the book of Revelation. Not to frighten us, but to remind us when history looks like it's out of control, it's not out of control. It's governed by God who sits upon the throne of this universe. The second most common symbol in the book of Revelation is the Lamb of God. Jesus is called the Lamb of God 30 times because that book is about God's sovereignty and Christ's redemption of the world. And it comes in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and he says, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. And then you turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 and 7, and John is caught up in a work worship service that's going on in heaven. We're not the only ones worshiping today. They're worshiping in heaven. And he hears them shouting. And what do they shout in Revelation 19? Hallelujah. Did you know the word hallelujah only appears in the book of Revelation in all the 27 books of the New Testament? It only appears in the book of Revelation. And four times, and it's in this worship service, they shout hallelujah for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Am I worried about the election on November 8th? No, I'm going to pray. I'm going to vote my conscience. And when Barbie and I get up the morning after the election, we're going to shout, Hallelujah, the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Hallelujah. 
Come on, let's lift up praise to the Lord today. God is in control. God is in control. And you gotta take that down to where you live. When your life feels it's out of control, and maybe it is in the moment, but you need to trust the Lord and believe that God is sovereign, that he is in control of your life. He sets the limits, he marks the boundaries, he determines the final outcome. This storm will pass. When Abraham Lincoln was assassinated at the end of the Civil War, the nation was in shock, grief, terror, a nation that was torn apart by a civil war. Do you know how many soldiers died in five years of combat? 600,000. 600 graves across the landscape of a nation as our citizens killed one another. It's a miracle this nation even survived that. And right after that, the president gets assassinated. People felt the whole country was out of control. They panicked. There was a large crowd gathered in New York at the news of Lincoln's assassination. They began to talk and began to spread their fears and worries and what are we going to do? And a man was in the middle of all that, began to hear all the panic and, and the confusion people had and the worry. So he went up on the side of a building where they had a set of, of steps and he got over the crowd and he shouted these words, the Lord reigns over Washington. The Lord reigns over Washington. And finally, the people stopped all of their talking and looked up at this guy and he shouted again, the Lord reigns over Washington. And they let those words sink in. And they stopped all their talking to their fears and the crowd dispersed and they went on with life. When things are out of control, it's a temporary storm. Just remember, God sets the limits. God marks out the boundaries. And God determines the ultimate outcome. You are always in God's care if you're one of his children. And you are always in God's control. And the great final lesson they learned is that they're always in God's calling. Jesus had called them to be disciples. If you're a Christian today, the Lord has called you to follow him. He's also given you a ministry, and he's given you a purpose like he had these men. These men had already been selected out of a group. They had been designated apostles. They had a calling on their life, and they also had a mission. He was going to the other side of the Galilee to do ministry. He said, let's go over to the other side. In the middle of that, there's a storm. And it's easy to tell yourself, if I'm in God's will, I shouldn't be going through the storm. That's the last thing you want to be telling yourself. The storm is temporary. You're just going through the storm. And furthermore, God uses those storms to mature our faith. If you don't go through storms, you'll never know how to get through the next storm. There's always another storm coming. It is the lessons learned in the storm that makes us strong and ability. They needed that storm because one day they were going to be put to the ultimate test when they had to witness for Jesus in a hostile culture. That storm was teaching them how to be strong in the storm and how to realize God is going to finish his purpose in spite of the storm. The storm does not stop God's purpose and calling in your life. Amen. God's calling is permanent in your life. And God uses those storms to mature our faith, to draw us closer to him. And that happened to those disciples that day. You've got to realize when you're going through problems and setbacks, that doesn't mean God's taken his calling off your life or God's disappointed in your life. It doesn't even mean you're out of the will of God. They're in the perfect will of God and they're in the middle of a great storm. You've got to remember Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know, everybody say, we know. We know. Say it like you believe it. We know. Now say, I know. I know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And he goes on to say, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, those he called, anybody called here this morning? Those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. You're always in God's care. You're in God's control, and you're in God's call for your life. And that night ended with two great questions. The first question he asked, why are you so afraid? 
And he followed it up. Do you still have no faith? And the second question answers the first one. Why are you so afraid? Because you have no faith. Why are you having all this panic? Because I have no faith. Why do you have so much worry in your life? Because you have no faith. Now you and I as Christians seem to have enough faith to get us to heaven, but not enough faith to get us through tomorrow. We've got faith for our salvation, but we don't have faith for our situation. And the God who saves us is the God who will be with us in the storm. It takes time for that faith to grow and develop. You still have no faith. You say, we're going through these problems. We're going through these health issues. I'm going through some family problems. I'm going through some financial difficulty. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you have no faith in God's person? Do you not know that God loves you with an everlasting love? Have you known him so long and you still have no faith in his providence that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? Do you still have no faith in his promises? There's not one word failed of his good promise. Do you still have no faith in his power that God is able to do exceeded abundantly above all that you ask or even think possible? Do you still have no faith in his presence? He said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And then they ask a question. It says they were terrified, terrified by the storm, such display of power. And the disciples said among themselves, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey his voice. You know, when you go through a storm, it's a great time for you to learn more about God than you've ever known. They begin to discover more of his power, more of his love, more of his grace through the storm. You'll learn more about God in the storm than any other season of your life. You'll learn the faithfulness of God and the providence of God and the power of God and the wisdom of God. When you see God work, you come through the storm and you'll stand amazed at the power and grace and workings of God in your life. They said, who is this? And isn't that the question this generation is asking? We're so confused by religions and philosophies and the world's looking at Jesus and they're asking the same question. Who is this? Who is this? He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the day star on high. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the faithful and true witness. He's the great high priest. He's the Holy One of Israel. Who is this? He's the image of the invisible God. He's the justifier of the repentant sinner. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the mediator. He is the new covenant. He is the overcomer. He is the prince of peace. He's the quickener of the dead. Who is this? He's the ruler, the kings of the age. He is the savior of the world. He is the truth. He is the undeniable evidence of God. He is the victor over death, hell, and the grave. He's the zeister of conviction. He is the word of God. He is the yielded servant of the Lord. He is the zenith of all truth. Who is this? who spoke the worlds into being. Who is this who hung the sun and moon in place? Who is this who calls out the stars by number and gives them all their name? Who is this born in Bethlehem's manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger? Who is this who spoke never as a man spoke? Who is this who went about doing good, healing all who are oppressed of the devil? Who is this who made himself of no reputation but took upon himself the form of a servant who is this who humbled himself and became obedient unto death even death on a cross who is this who wore the crown of thorns who is this who was nailed to a Roman crucifix who is this who arose on Easter morning who is this who ascended into heaven who is this who sits at the right hand of God Almighty who is this whoever lives to make intercession for us who is this who is our great high priest who is this who must reign until every enemy has been put under his feet. Who is this who is the sovereign king of the most high God? Who is this? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Who is this? All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Who is this? In him was life and his life was the light of all men. Who is this? The light shined in the darkness but the darkness could not conquer it. Who is this? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is 
this, wherefore God has highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Who is this? He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Praise his wonderful name. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. You're always in God's care. You're always in God's control. And you're always in God's calling. Stand with me for prayer, please. Just lift your hands toward heaven. Open your hands like you want to receive something. Ask God for peace today. Open your hands up. Say, Lord, give me peace. Only God can give a person peace. Only God can give a person peace. Open your hands up. Say, Lord, I give you my fear today. I cast it on you. Open it up. Open your hands up. Lord, I give you my fear. I let it go. I, I cast it on you today. I cast my anxiety, my worry. And Lord, with open hands, I receive your peace. I receive your peace. That reminds me I'm always in your care. I'm always in your control. And yes, I'm always in your calling on my life. You've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Bible says if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. In these moments we share, if you just simply pray, Lord Jesus, I believe you are God's only Son, the Savior of the world. I give you my sin today. I cannot save myself. Lord, I ask for and I receive your forgiveness for every sin. I receive you this day as my Savior. I confess you as my Lord. I commit my life to you here and now. It has been great to share this time of worship with you. The psalmist says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Sunday is the day that we gather to worship the Lord as we begin our week together. It's amazing to me how refreshed we are spiritually, and what strength we gain when we come together to worship the Lord. I ask for your prayers for me and the pastoral staff and the entire ministry of our church that we would continue to know and to do the will of God. I also appreciate the support that you give to the church as you're able to help the church with tithes and offerings as the Lord leads you. Finally, it is incumbent upon all of us to become evangelists. Now, I know sometimes that may feel intimidating for all of us. We might not even feel qualified to share our faith, but we are. We're all living witnesses of Jesus Christ. Take this worship service, the music, the prayers, the Word of God that is shared, and share them with your friends and those who need the Lord. Again, thank you for being a part of this great worship service today, and I pray God's richest blessings on you as you begin a new week.